I think the Rolex in your Hobart race has just been an impossibly difficult race to win. Line honours or handicap, it's just very hard. There's this irrational passion that keeps coming back. You get some of these all around the world, but here they just come through with such speed. It's dangerous, but if you haven't done a Hobart, there's something that you really got to do. The race is actually in the hearts and the minds of the general public. People often ask you, how many Hobarts have you done? It's really part of the fabric of Australia. The circumstances can decide the winner and you just might be the last man standing. Until 2020, when the pandemic forced the cancellation of the Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race just six days before it was due to begin, Sydney siders had flocked to the harbour's foreshores to watch the start of the event on each and every December the 26th in its 75-year history. That a determined and diverse fleet of nearly 90 boats has reassembled a year later is a source of pride for race organisers, the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania, and in Sydney, the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia. The cancellation of the race last year was devastating. To get so close and not get there in the end was just an experience none of us ever want to have again. That's what makes us all so excited. I feel confident that we've got a race this year and really looking forward to seeing it happen. For some Australian sailors, winning the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race is a lifelong passion, bordering on obsession. For Sydney cider David Witt, skipper of SHK Scallywag 100, it's an ambition nurtured for the whole of his professional career. Growing up in Sydney, growing up in Cronulla, I watched it as a little kid and got enthralled with it as a 10 year old and always wanted to be part of it and now I find myself doing my 25th so I can't seem to find anything better to do on Boxing Day. As a skipper, Lionel's glory has so far eluded him, and the fact that the five strong Super Maxi lineup battling for Line Honours in 2019 has this year been reduced to three doesn't necessarily improve his crew's chances. There's so many variables in the race, and there's also so many things that can go wrong, especially with these 100 footers for Line Honours, because any downtime, the speed difference is 10 knots. And if you have a problem for 30 minutes, you lose five mile. It's certainly never over till you get across the finish line in this race, that's for sure. What would it mean to me to win this race? Sort of a goal I set myself as a 10 year old and I'm 50. So I think what it would mean, it'd just be a huge relief. Complicating the picture for Wit and rivals Christian Beck on Law Connect and Mark Bradford on Blackjack is the prediction of a strong and potentially damaging first night southerly, likely to accentuate the characteristics of each of their boats. They're actually very different, right? You've got us, big heavy boat with lots of riding moment, huge sails. You've got Blackjack, very light boat with not so much riding moment, very sleek through the water. And you've got Scallywag a bit in the middle. I think the reality is the first day favours us hugely. The second day is not ideal for us. We're probably going to look great on the first day. <laughs> How we fare on the second is very hard to predict. It's not snakes and ladders, but it's the hare and the tortoise, I think, will be what this one's about. And not saying that our boat's a slow boat by any means, but there'll be a lead established on the first day and it'll be about running that lead down. But if these three boats make it through that first night, we could potentially have a good result out of these boats in the overall. To win overall and take home the distinctive Tattersall Cup, they'll first have to see off current holders Itchy Balm. Returning to defend their title, a feat no crew has achieved since Freyers in 1965, Matt Allen's team is now gunning for a third win, having also swept all before them in 2017. 
It's really hard to assess whether we can go and win the race again. We're really confident in the boat and the crew, but you do need those elements of, of luck to be in the right size range. To win three times with this boat would be an incredible achievement. We don't put any extra pressure on ourselves. We just go there to do our best, let the boat perform, we'll roll the dice, see how we go. After leaving the colour and clamour of Sydney Harbour, the race route takes the fleet south down the coast of New South Wales, past Green Cape and out into the notoriously unpredictable Bass Strait. The eastern coast of Tasmania can also be difficult, and once past Tasman Island, the fleet still has Storm Bay to negotiate, followed by the fickle breezes of the Derwent River, a total of 628 nautical miles. Race day returns, and 88 boats assemble in the starting area. Ahead of them, a freshening southeasterly breeze to help them on their way. Beyond that, a challenging 36 hours that will test their teamwork and tenacity to the very limit. Away they go, racing in the 76th Rolex. Sydney Hobart, the great race south is on. 628 nautical miles to Hobart. The Maxis make a blistering start at the far end of the line, flanked by a spectator fleet relishing the proximity to the action. What a sight. There's the four start lines, one of the great sights in the world of yachting. It's not long before the leaders are climbing through the gears, up to 15 knots, 18 knots and beyond. And look at those maxis down the western side of the harbour, charging away. And the scallywag's just got his nose in front. Reaching the first of the two turning marks takes just a few minutes in the stiffening 15-knot breeze. Sydney Harbour, again a buzz with movement, energy and noise. Here's the first turning mark. This is going to be very interesting. So David Whip wins the honours to the heads. On leaving the harbour, the leaders turn into strong southerly headwinds and the really hard work begins. Just at the first turning mark, that's Celestial. Sam Haynes, he's been third in this race. Ichiban. Ichiban, pulling off a very tricky manoeuvre. This could go all the way to the finish line. Oh, here's some drama. Something's happened to Scallywag. They've blown their headsail or their force day out. Problems with their J2 tack fitting see David Witt's crew slow dramatically. Forced to bear away to address the issue, they hand back their hard-won advantage and Law Connect takes the lead. The rest of the fleet exit unscathed, their hopes and aspirations so far intact. Among them, previous winners and potential winners, and many entries for whom a safe arrival in Hobart will perhaps be the greatest prize of all. For the first time, the race this year includes a separate division for two-handed entries. Although not eligible for the overall title, it promises to be highly competitive and includes Michael and Matty Bell on Kai Mai, a father and son team with very different skill sets. An event-winning surf ski competitor, Matty's sailing experience is largely confined to skiff and dinghy racing and he's taking part in the race for the first time. He's also a personal fitness instructor, with Michael, an 11 race veteran, now among his most committed clients. I believe the father-son dynamic will help us a lot. We both work well off each other. I spend a lot of time with him training in the gym or on the boat, so we both know our tactics and how we want to do it. Help more balls. all the way in. I first started 18 months ago with Matt, and he adapted a program that complemented the things that I'm physically going to have to do at my tender age. All right, when you're ready, let's go again. Yeah. If we can finish in the top half of this year's Rolex Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race, I'll be very, very happy. If we can get a podium finish, I'll be over the moon.
There's also a range of experience on another two-handed entry, Disco Trooper Contender Sailcloth, where Jan Klog Scholten has completed 18 Sydney Hobart races to Jules Hall's four. But should anything go wrong for the two former laser sailors, they know they can rely on each other. We've had some big challenges actually. We've broken things on the, on the warm-up races, we've had things go wrong, really worryingly wrong. Yet when those things have happened, it's how we've come together as a team. I'm going to be satisfied if we make it there and we've done everything the best we can. I'll be disappointed if we fall short of something that we've practiced for or our experience could cover. We often talk in the two-handed fleet that our main competition is fatigue. It's going to be very, very physical sailing out there. Big waves, heavy winds, it's how we can continue to perform in those adverse conditions. Where's it won and lost? Probably before the start line. It's that preparation, planning, are you ready for it? It's a question being asked throughout the fleet not least on the three super maxis plunging south in potentially boat-breaking seas. David Witt's crew on SHK Scallywag 100 have staged an impressive recovery, repairing the damaged deck fitting that forced them to deploy their storm salt. Ahead of them, the team on Law Connect prepare to hunker down and power down to preserve both their boat and their narrow lead. This Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race is a great adventure and what we're seeing today is the reason why this is such a challenge. The first night southerly takes a heavy toll. By the afternoon of day two, it's confirmed in Hobart that over a third of the fleet has been forced to retire. This feels more like a traditional Hobart. The last time we had 25 or 30 boats retire was 2015. The 58 yachts that are out there now are hunkered in. They're going hard and they're really looking forward to getting down here. The force of the first night conditions are felt throughout the fleet including the group of TP-52s emerging as leading contenders in the battle for the overall title. Last night was a really brutal night. Quite big seas, 30 knots of breeze and rain. It rained almost all night. It was pretty brutal on the crew and uh, brutal on the boat. We just kept on trucking along during the night, so we're closing the gap. I think we're running third on the overall standings. There's contrasting fortunes in the two-handed division, where Jules Hall and Jan Scholten have survived the night unscathed. So day two, we are 75 miles offshore. Pretty bumpy last night. We've lost the four-peak door. We had a big squall at five o'clock last night. That came through about 36 knots. 125. Oh, get in there. It just sounds like the left-hander we've been looking for. We are on fire. On father and son entry Kai Mai, the mood is less upbeat. Heading into last night, um, as that 30 knot suddenly kicked in, tried to do our best to push through it. Had to reduce sail. Early hours of the morning, a bit of illness kicked in. Spent a bit of time thinking about it and then made the decision to pull the pin. Um, in the process of that, discovered that we had a rope around our rudder and around our propeller, so unable to start the engine to motor back to Sydney. All in all, a very eventful night. 30 boats are now heading back to Sydney or Century elsewhere. On SHK Scallywag, David Witt's men are hunting down the two boats disputing the lead in front of them. The going's good, but who can make best use of the lighter conditions further south? Law Connect struggles on reaching the ridge of high pressure off the east coast of Tasmania. As winds decrease, Blackjack asserts its light air supremacy, and Mark Bradford's crew take the initiative in what proves a trying night for their opponents. We had a tough night on the Law Connect last night. 
we sailed on a bit of a light patch first, or one of the boats was able to get round us, and that's where the uh, the other boats are really, really good. When they're doing eight knots, we're doing four or something like that. We think we've still got a chance, we've just got to fat a lot. Assisted by the incoming southeasterly, Black Jack tries to press home the advantage. Only for Christian Beck's crew to reel them back in. The distance between them rarely more than a few nautical miles. It's not till later in the day that Black Jack builds a significant lead. First to reach the turning mark at Tasman Island after playing the wind shifts in search of the elusive breeze. Relentless in their pursuit, David Witt's crew claw their way back into contention for second place as the Super Maxis contest the final rounds of a heavyweight contest which, as predicted, has well and truly gone the distance. In the hours that follow, the breeze falls away, but once established, Black Jack's lead does not. Barely a breath of wind, they complete the 11 miles up the Derwent River to cross the line at 1.37 in the morning after two days, 12 hours and 37 minutes of ocean racing. After several near misses, it's line on as victory at last for owner Peter Harburg and skipper Mark Bradford, the culmination of a project 14 years in the making. This team's been together since 2008 and the last five years we've had this boat and we've really modified the boat and pushed for a win here and, and we've come up short a couple of times but um, yeah, it just feels amazing to win. Tasmania has been synonymous with boats and boat building for well over 150 years. At the Wooden Boat Centre at Franklin in the Huon Valley, not far from Hobart, they use the tools and techniques for which the state was once renowned. Schooling students of all ages in the art and joy of building boats from wood. When I first started, I loved the idea of building out of wood. Us chairs and tables, they're kind of practical, but a boat is really practical, really gorgeous. It's just so many things roll into one. The idea of the school is to give people the skills to build or at least feel confident in repairing their own boats. It's a lot of work building a boat and in one year we can't fully achieve everything that you know, a boat builder needs to know, but we try and give them the basic fundamental tools so they can get started. In the early years of the Sydney to Hobart race, nearly all entries were made from wood. Although slower, they were also stronger and well equipped to withstand the kind of conditions characterizing this year's event. In a wooden boat, everything moves and there's no straight lines. So when you go into heavy weather, it's possibly the boat is more resilient than something made of new materials that are fast, but also fragile. They're amazing vessels, but timber boats, they're a testament to the boat builders and the shipwrights and the materials back in the day. They were meant to last. So the race of many races continues. How does it feel? Awesome. This is what we've been training for. Yeah. We are making time. After a tough night in which they lost ground to their rivals, Jules Hall and Jan Scholten are back in the hunt for the lead in the two-handed division. Oh, look at this. Two sails. Fast. Ahead of them, the race for the overall title is reaching a critical stage. Still favoured as likely contenders are the TP-52s, where a tight tactical battle is being waged down the east coast of Tasmania, dominated by Celestial and Itchy Barn. This is uh, Will Oxley, uh, navigator of Itchy Barn. Uh, Will, what's, uh, where are we and what's happening? We're about six miles from Tasman Island, and, uh, in close proximity with Celestial, just behind. Been a pretty tough and tricky race so far, but he's hoping the next 42 miles goes well. On the approach to Cape Rock, Itchy Barn still holds a narrow lead on the water, but trails Celestial on corrected time. Experienced and well-resourced, Matt Allen's crew are not about to relinquish their title without a fight. 
Sam Haynes' team on Celestial has sailed a brilliant race to stay in touch. If they could negotiate Storm Bay and the Derwent River without mishap, a first overall race victory is potentially within their grasp. In 2018, closing in on another podium finish, Itchy Barnes' challenge faltered in dying breeze on the Derwent River. This time, a shortage of breeze is not the issue. Only the proximity of Celestial, barely 400 meters behind them at one stage, in what has become an enduring and absorbing match race. Neither is the tussle between the two concluded when they cross the finish line. Celestial just ahead on corrected time. Got them on time. I don't know exactly the standings, but at this stage I believe that we're sort of like the leaders in the clubhouse. On arrival, the defending champions join the protest lodged by the race committee against Celestial for failing to maintain a listening radio watch. This had become apparent when a personal locator beacon on Celestial was activated accidentally and her crew could not be contacted for 90 minutes. The double protest is upheld by the international jury and a discretionary penalty of 40 minutes is added to Celestial's finish time and three minutes deducted from Itchy Barnes. The net effect is to promote the title holder at the expense of the challengers. I do respect the decision. At this time, I can't tell you how devastating it is to end up being not able to claim potentially a prize that we, we were so close to getting. Few of the boats arriving at Constitution Dock to a warm welcome in the meantime pose any threat to Itchy Barnes' position as provisional leader. One that does is Shane Kern's White Bay 6 Azuro. From a similar position at the top of the leaderboard in 2015, she ended up third when the breeze died on the Derwent River. This time, the wind gods are no kinder. And after another spirited challenge, they finish fours behind Simon Kurtz's redoubtable Love and War. With their dramatic victory, Itchy Barn joins Love and War and Freya as the only three-time winners of the Tattersall Cup. It's amazing to be part of the history and the fabric of the Rolex Sydney to Hobart race with a back-to-back -back win. I mean, we're just so elated, the crew so elated. This year's race was an incredibly difficult race, probably the hardest on the boats and the crew that we've seen for, for many years. Also among the prize winners for their overall victory in the inaugural two-handed division are Jules Hall and Jan Scholten. For them, and for their fellow competitors, the 2021 Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race will live long in the memory. Next time, we head to San Francisco and Sydney for the Sail GP season finale.
July 1st, 1863. The bloodiest battle of America's Civil War begins between Union and Confederate forces in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. 1946. The world's first peacetime test of a nuclear weapon. The United States explodes a 20 kiloton atomic bomb near Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. 1898. In Cuba, future President Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders wage a victorious assault on San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. 1961. I think the biggest disease this world suffers from in this day and age is the disease of people feeling unloved. And I know that I can give love. Britain's Princess Diana is born Diana Spencer near Sandringham, England. The charismatic Diana drew worldwide fame and tabloid headlines before her death in a Paris car crash at age 36. 1997. In Asia, Hong Kong returns to Chinese rule after more than 150 years as a British colony. China's communist leaders promise to let Hong Kong keep its capitalist ways and civil liberties for the next 50 years. And 2004. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Actor Marlon Brando, stage and silver screen legend, dies in Los Angeles at age 80. Among his roles, A Streetcar Named Desire, On the Waterfront, and The Godfather. Today in History, July 1st, Camille Bohannon, The Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 